Hello everyone and welcome to Act 1, Scene 2, the final video for this scene. So we finally come to the end of Act 1, Scene 2. So remember, we're still in that same scene that we've been in. So February 15th and Antony has gone off to the races and we have already seen Cassius and Brutus go through their exchange in terms of why it's a good idea to get rid of Caesar and perhaps as Cassius is trying to convince him why Brutus is a better fit for the role of ruler of Rome. That being said, we're going to end scene two with the reintroduction of these characters that we saw in the beginning of scene two. So we're going to see Caesar, Antony, and Casca reappear. Voices and music are heard approaching. The games are done, and Caesar is returning. As they pass by, pluck Casca by the sleeve, and he will, after his sour fashion, tell you what hath preceded worthy note today. Re-enter Caesar and his train of followers. I will do so. But look you, Cassius, the angry spot doth glow on Caesar's brow, and all the rest look like a chidden train. Calpurnia's cheek is pale, and Cicero looks with such ferret and such fiery eyes as we have seen him in the capital, being crossed in conference by some senators. Casca will tell us what the matter is. Caesar looks at Cassius and turns to Antony. Antonius, Caesar, let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-haired men, and such as sleep o' nights. Yond Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Fear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He is a noble Roman and well given. Would he were fatter, but I fear him not. Yet, if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I should avoid so soon as that spare Cassius. He reads much. He is a great observer, and he looks quite through the deeds of men. He loves no plays as thou dost, Antony. He hears no music. Seldom he smiles, and smiles in such a sort as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he be never at heart's ease, whiles they behold a greater than themselves, and therefore are they very dangerous. I rather tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear, for always I am Caesar. Come on my right hand, for this ear is deaf, and tell me truly what thou thinkst of him. Trumpets sound, exuant Caesar and all his train except Casca, who stays behind. You pulled me by the cloak. Would you speak with me? Aye, Casca. Tell us what doth chance today that Caesar looks so sad. Why, you were with him, were you not? I should not then ask Casca what had chanced. Why, there was a crown offered him, and being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand, thus, and then the people fell a shouting. What was the second noise for? Why, for that too. They shouted thrice, what was the last cry for? Why, for that too. Was the crown offered him thrice? Aye, Mary wast, and he put it by thrice, every time gentler than the other, and at every putting by, my honest neighbors shouted. Who offered him the crown? Why, Antony. Tell us the manner of it, gentle Casca. I can as well be hanged as tell the manner of it. It were mere foolery. I did not mark it. I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown. Yet twas not a crown neither, twas one of those coronets. And, as I told you, he put it by once. But for all that, to my thinking, he would fain have had it. Then he offered it to him again. Then he put it by again. But to my thinking, he was very loath to lay his fingers off it. And then he offered it the third time. He put it the third time by. And still, as he refused it, the rabble men hooted and clapped their chapped hands and threw up their sweaty nightcaps and uttered such a deal of stinking breath because Caesar refused the crown that it had, almost, choked Caesar, for he swooned and fell down at it. And for mine own part, I durst not laugh for fear of opening my lips and receiving the bad air. But soft, I pray you, what, did Caesar swoon? 
He fell down in the marketplace, and foamed at mouth, and was speechless. Tis very like. He hath the falling sickness. No, Caesar hath not it. But you, and I, and honest Casca, we have the falling sickness. I know not what you mean by that, but I am sure Caesar fell down. If the tag-rag people did not clap him and hiss him, according as he pleased and displeased them, as they used to do the players in the theater, I am no true man. What said he when he came unto himself? Mary, before he fell down, when he perceived the common herd was glad he refused the crown, he plucked me up his doublet and offered them his throat to cut. And I had been a man of any occupation. If I would not have taken him at a word, I would I might go to hell among the rogues. And so he fell. When he came to himself again, he said, if he had done or said anything amiss, he desired their worships to think it was his infirmity. Three or four wenches where I stood cried, Alas, good soul, and forgave him with all their hearts. But there's no heed to be taken of them. If Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have done no less. And after that, he came thus sad away, I. Did Cicero say anything? I. he spoke Greek. To what effect? Nay, and I tell you that, I'll ne'er look you in the face again. But those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for mine own part, he was Greek to me. I could tell you more news too. Morellus and Flavius, for pulling scarves off Caesar's images, are put to silence. Fare you well. There was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. Will you sup with me tonight, Casca? No, I am promised forth. Will you dine with me tomorrow? Aye, if I be alive, and your mind hold, and your dinner worth eating. Good, I will expect you. Do so. Farewell both. Exit. What a blunt fellow he is grown to be. He was quick metal when he went to school. So is he now in execution of any bold or noble enterprise. However, he puts on this tardy form. This rudeness is a sauce to his good wit, which gives men's stomach to digest his words with better appetite. And so it is. For this time, I will leave you. Tomorrow, if you please to speak with me, I will come home to you. Or, if you will, come home to me, and I will wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Exit Brutus. Well, Brutus, thou art noble, yet I see thy honorable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Therefore it is meet that noble minds keep ever with their likes, for who so firm that cannot be seduced? Caesar doth bear me hard, but he loves Brutus. If I were Brutus now, and he were Cassius, he should not humor me. I will this night, in several hands, and at his windows throw, as if they came from several citizens, writings, all tending to the great opinion that Rome holds of his name, wherein obscurely Caesar's ambitions shall be glanced at. And after this, let Caesar seat him sure, for we will shake him, or worse days endure. Exit. So we have finally done it. We have reached the end of scene two, and we begin to see the conspiracy unfold piece by piece. And a big thing to remember about this conspiracy is that Casca, although he has spent a majority of scene two in the presence of Caesar, is indeed part of the conspiracy. So we're going to begin where we see Cassius remind Brutus that they need to pull Casca aside to understand what has occurred and exactly what the Shadden has been all about. Because remember, Brutus, Brutus and Cassius have been off scene in terms of what's been happening at the races. And as the train of Caesar re-enters, right, his followers along with him, Brutus notes very well that there's a change in his friend, that not only does Caesar look angry, right, that angry spot with glow on his brow, but the rest of them, he says, look like a chidden train. So think about when you've been chastised or punished by your parents, right? It's not a good feeling. You might get a, a dark look over your face. And this is the look that Brutus is seeing on the train of people behind Caesar. So now more than ever, the men need to understand what has happened off screen. So the next words out of Casca that tell us this are going to be very important for them to understand. 
But before we get there, we're going to see Caesar and Antony exchange very important dialogue with one another. But remember, this is an example of an aside. So rather than having their conversation in front of the other characters, we need to remember that Caesar and Antony are the only ones who can hear one another, that Cassius, Casca, Brutus, and the rest of the train are not privy to the conversation between them. And that's a good thing, because Caesar is revealing something about his feelings towards Cassius. And he begins first by saying this, that he wants to have men about him that are fat. And rather than this being a physical description, right, he doesn't want people who are overweight surrounding him, he means he just wants people who are loyal. That word fat meaning loyal rather than referring to their physical appearance. And he also wants men who can sleep the night, he says. So men who not only are loyal, but they have a clear conscience. Think about it, if you're worried or anxious about something, it's hard to sleep. He doesn't want those kind of people. But when he looks at Cassius, this is exactly what he sees in him, right? This person who's dishonest, who is not loyal. In fact, he says that he has this lean and hungry look. When we think about that, we associate those terms with animals. So Caesar is saying that this passion for power that he views in Cassius makes him very wary. Antony, however, strangely enough, is going to tell Caesar not to fear. Don't worry, he's not dangerous. And the reason he gives, ironically, is it's because he's a noble Roman, meaning because of Cassius's high status, he should be trusted. And this is one of the blind spots that we see in Antony. And that we see in general, if we think about it, when we look at how the upper class are viewed, right? They tend to be treated with more nobility, with more respect. And usually just because of their title, right? That oftentimes it's easy to look at someone's station, their occupation, for example, and think that we know truly about their character, right? When these are two different things. And Antony is going to learn it the hard way. But this brings up something in Caesar, right? This idea that, well, Antony now thinks that I fear him. But remember, Caesar's status as this godlike figure needs to be maintained, and he's going to seek to maintain it. So he's going to distance these feelings that he's having. So while he does indeed fear Cassius's motives and his loyalty, he's going to say, it's not that I fear him, but if I were someone who could be afraid, he would be someone that I would avoid. And so we begin to see this prideful aspect of Caesar's nature. So although it's clear that he distrusts Cassius, he doesn't accept his own emotions in a sense, right, given his high position. And next we begin to see more clearly why Caesar does not trust Cassius, right? But again, his pride is going to get in the way of him taking these logical steps in order to avoid or push Cassius away to a safe distance. And one of the things that he knows about Cassius is that he is able to perceive the inner thoughts of people, right? That he quite looks through the deeds of men. And this is something that Caesar views as dangerous, right? And we know that it's very true of Cassius. One of his greater qualities is that he's able to perceive the hearts of men. It's how he's able to perceive that Brutus values honor and then as a result, use that honor to manipulate him. Additionally, he goes into all of these long lines about how he doesn't like music, he doesn't like to listen to plays like you do, Antony. There's not that human quality of emotion or sentimentality that exists within him. And he says because of this, men like him are never comfortable with having to be under the rule of someone else. And again, Caesar here, for all of his faults, we see that he's speaking very truly about Cassius. Cassius does indeed not want to be viewed as this person who lives underneath of Caesar's yoke, and he's going to do anything to rid himself of that. Again, hence, because of Cassius' ambition, he is dangerous. But again, Caesar cannot get rid of his pride. He said, I would, if I were a fearing man, fear that. But I am Caesar, right? Speaking about himself in the third person. 
And then finally, just a small note, one other thing we learn about Caesar in terms of his physical qualities is that he is deaf in one ear. And also, this is an interesting note because now, off stage, out of the presence of the audience as well, Antony is going to reveal after Caesar's discussion what he truly thinks of Cassius. So Caesar and Antony have left for the end of scene two, and now we turn solely to our three potential conspirators, Casca, Brutus, and Cassius. And one important thing to note about Casca is that he will speak in prose, not in blank verse. And again, this is an indicator of his social status. So although he is in the conspiracy with all of these men from the Senate, from the higher class, Casca is not going to be on the same social standing as them. We're going to see that in the way that his dialogue plays out. And at times, the way that he focuses on these crude jokes and how he downplays his intelligence. And one of the things we see then is here, this idea of downplaying his intelligence, because Brutus asks Casca, what happened to make Caesar so upset? And he asks him this question, why? You were with him, were you not? And Brutus replies, I should not then ask Casca what had chanced, right? Brutus essentially saying, well, obviously, if I were there, I wouldn't need to ask you, right? But we can also look at Casca's question this way. You were with him, were you not? If you're with someone, right, if you support them, you have their back, you're loyal to them. So perhaps, right, Casca, who would have known of the friendship of Brutus and Caesar, is trying to subtly hint at Brutus's loyalty, right? And so here Casca then, after he assesses that Brutus was not physically there and that on a metaphorical sense, right, he's no longer with Caesar, he begins to tell Brutus and Cassius that Caesar has put aside this crown that was offered to him. And not just once, not just twice, but three times. And this is insanely significant, guys. From the very beginning of the play, we talked about this idea that the conspirators believe that they need to stop Caesar's rise to power, that with the way paid for him, he can grab the crown. But here we have Caesar three times denying a crown, right, this symbol of power. So we need to really assess whether or not the judgment of the conspirators is right. Does Caesar really want the crown, or is there something more diabolical going on here? So again, Casca confirming for us that yes, he has denied the crown three times times. And interestingly, the more Caesar denies the crown, the more crazy the crowd goes for him. And remember, the crowd is going to be made up prim primarily of the commoners, right? The majority of the people in Rome. And this is going to be a problem that Cassius is going to need to fix later. And we'll get to that when we come to the end of scene two. But right, to, to rule, you need to have popular vote, a popular majority. And Caesar has that, something that makes him dangerous. So even though we see Caesar rejecting the crown, right, and that this would seem to sort of disprove what the conspirators are saying, it needs to bring up this question in our mind, is Caesar really as power hungry as they think? And then Casca is going to talk about something else that happened after Caesar rejects the crown. And here, as this lower class character, Casca is also going to be used by Shakespeare to provide comic relief, something he often does throughout his plays. Right? And the majority of Casca's comedic relief is going to come from the episode that happens with Caesar where he faints. Right? But before this happens, he relays the fact that a majority of what went on with Caesar was foolery. He says, I didn't mark it, meaning I didn't think it was that important. But he also reveals something very interesting. Right, In the midst of this comedy, he's going to interject exactly how he feels about Caesar. And he says, even though Caesar pushed aside the crown, he would fain have had it. And this means that he was reluctant to let it go. 
So Casca believes that Caesar is simply acting and refusing the crown. And he even goes on to say he was very loath to lay his fingers off of it, meaning that he pushes away the crown, but you can imagine that his fingers, the tips of his fingers, still clutch part of the crown and reluctantly give it up. So again, this answer to the question, are they founded in saying that Caesar is really that power hungry, right? On a mental level, they believe so, right? Their prejudice against Caesar helps to make them think that they are correct. And here is where we're getting to our comedic relief. And so Casca is going to reply that Caesar faints because all about him, these commoners in their chapped hands, meaning very dry and cracked, their sweaty nightcaps, so think about a really dirty, musty hat and their stinking breath, all of this shouting, just the air is filled. Just think if for those of you who maybe haven't been brushing your teeth very often during quarantine, please do for the sake of your housemates. But that being said, imagine you hadn't brushed your teeth for, for weeks. This is the type of smell that is going to be surrounding Caesar, according to Casca. And this is why he says he faints. And he goes on to make a joke about it, right? Caesar fell down and I looked at that, right? And rather than opening my lips, I didn't say anything, right? For fear that I would faint like he did. So we need to imagine, right? That the crowd watching this play at this point would be rolling in laughter, right? This is exactly the type of crude uh, comedy that Shakespeare often slips into his plays. But on the same time, we need to see that it's also sort of a, a shot at the commoners, right? He's making a joke at their expense. And now Cassius, ever the higher class figure, is trying to get them back on track. And so as we go through the rest of the scene, we need to pay attention to how each character talks about Caesar. So Casca has already shown us that he's very wary of Caesar and he doesn't trust that his actions are genuine. And now we're going to see another thing, that Brutus is very knowledgeable about Caesar. And up until now, he treats him with a great deal of respect, given the fact that they're talking about treason, right? Overthrowing Caesar. But Cassius says, no, it's not that Caesar has the falling sickness, meaning epilepsy, medical condition, right? That they would have referred to as falling sickness. We, me, Brutus, Casca, we have the falling sickness, but here Cassius doesn't mean that they have epilepsy. He is making a metaphor, right? Every time we have to bow down to Caesar, that's a falling sickness, right? Think of the power of that word, right? Sickness. So he's relating bowing down to Caesar as something that puts you in a precarious position, something that leads you closer and closer to death. So we know exactly how Cassius feels about Caesar. And so Casca, ever the lower class character, right? He brushes off what Cassius is saying, this deep sentiment that Cassius is getting at. He says, I really don't know what you mean, but I looked at the crowd, right? And they would do anything for him, right? Even if he displeases them, they praise him. And this is going to be just more fuel to the fire, right? They need to quash Caesar before the commoners promote them themselves. So Casca is going to go through one last long chunk of dialogue before we see him leave the scene. And it's going to be continue to be steeped in comedy. And so we're going to see that in the midst of his falling, Caesar here is going to pluck open his, his jacket, this doublet, meaning that it's buttoned with, with two rows. And he offers the crowd his throat to cut. And this is what Casca is saying that he saw. And he's saying, had I been a man of any occupation, meaning had I been like them, he was so convincing, I would have believed that he wanted me to and I would have killed him myself. And so he's doing this to show that Caesar loses his mind for a moment in the midst of this epileptic attack. Something strange happens. And even in the midst of that strangeness, when Caesar comes back to his full senses, he asks for their forgiveness, right? It's not me. It's just the fact that I have this disease. And Casca looks around the crowd and he sees all of these commoners falling on, on their knees to forgive him, almost, right? He even goes so far as to say, 
if he has stabbed their mothers, right? Think about that. You could never forgive someone like that, could you, right? But Casca is saying they love Caesar so much that they would do it. So again, we clearly see that Casca views the commoners as being enchanted with Caesar and that this is going to be a big problem that they need to fix. And here we see that Cassius is going to ask about Cicero. And what we need to know about Cicero is that he is a member of the Senate, right? So it's important that they understand where he is at, right? Because this is all a political power play, getting rid of Caesar and promoting Brutus or one of the other men, right? But we really don't get to see what Cicero says because Casca, being a lower class character, is not going to be able to understand everything that is said in this higher class dialogue. He even makes a joke about it, right? It was all Greek to me. And this is an idiom that we still use today from Shakespeare's time. So if maybe you're in class and a teacher is explaining something and your friend asks what they meant, you say, it was all Greek to me, meaning you didn't understand a word of it, right? So Casca at this point in terms of what Cicero said is useless, but he provides interesting information from scene one. Remember, Morellus and Flavius, those two tribunes of the people, went around and removed or disrobed these statues. And this was something that they were not supposed to do. It is a legal violation because of the festival of Lupercal, right? And he reveals that Morellus and Flavius have been punished. And he says that they have been put to silence. And there's two ways that we could interpret this. So the first, the more logical, thing that we would often think of, right? They are put to death, right? When you're dead, you can no longer speak, you're silent. The second conclusion we might come to, a little less morbid, is the fact that they were simply removed from public life, so they were exiled for their crimes. And lastly, we see that Cassius and Casca are going to meet up to have dinner later. And we can only assume that it's going to be for issues of ironing out that conspiracy, right? Because remember, Cassius and Casca are in on it together. So just as we cannot trust Cassius, we need to be very wary of Casca as well. But before Casca leaves, always the comedic figure, right? He makes this joke. So yes, I'll dine with you tomorrow if we're both still alive, if you still feel like it, and if your dinner is worth eating, right? So when we see Casca in the future, we need to expect or have this expectation, right? That he is going to provide comedic relief. So here Brutus is going to make a comment about Casca's very strange behavior, right? And he's going to say that he was quick metal when he went to school, meaning metal that he was clever. So Brutus is saying, essentially, I don't know what happened to Casca. He used to be smart. He's kind of taken a turn for the worse. And Cassius is going to bring up the fact that this is just all an act. He puts on this tardy form or this show for the sake of others. So again, another reason why we really shouldn't be too quick to trust Casca. So Cassius now is going to dive in at the very last part of this scene into his soliloquy. But before we get there, so again, we have Cassius explaining that Casca only acts like this clown, right? To make his words go better with others, right? To be more of a people pleaser in a sense, or someone whose words are taken by others. And Brutus is going to then dive into, well, I can't speak about this anymore now, but I will come to you tomorrow and we can speak about it further then. So Brutus is then going to leave and Cassius begins his soliloquy. Now remember, when we talk about a soliloquy, this is a moment where the character is speaking to themselves, right? They're talking aloud and it reveals their innermost thoughts and intentions. So one of the very first things that we see in terms of Cassius' innermost thoughts and intentions is that he believes that Brutus, by nature of his honorability, can easily be manipulated. 
So here, the word wrought, meaning manipulated. So Cassius is going to use Brutus's honor against him. And he underlines this with his rhetorical question at the end here, for who so firm that cannot be seduced? Meaning there is no one who has such a good character that they cannot be tricked. So automatically, we need to be on our guard of Brutus. And we begin to see more here exactly what sort of designs Cassius has for Brutus and why we should be so worried for him. And one of the things that he says is this, if I were Brutus now and he were Cassius, meaning if our roles were switched, he would not humor me, meaning that Cassius wouldn't be tricked. So not only is Cassius seeking to manipulate Brutus, he thinks himself better mentally than Brutus, right? And for a point, he might be, right? Because Brutus has fallen hook, line, and sinker for this act of Cassius's. And we see next that Cassius plans to write a number of letters, and he says in several hands, meaning in different types of handwriting. And he's going to slip them into Brutus's window at the cover of night, and that these letters are not only going to praise the name of Brutus, but also slander the name of Caesar. And he's going to do this to get him to agree with him. And remember, we've been talking about the plays of Caesar being written in blank verse, meaning although they are iambic pentameter, they do not rhyme. But here we have an exception. In these last two lines, I've made in bold those last two words, sure and endure, to remind us that this is very much reminiscent of a couplet rhyme, meaning that end couplet at the very end of a sonnet. And Shakespeare often would do this as a way to wrap up a scene and indicate to the audience that one scene is closed and the next is coming. This is it for video number 23. Thank you for hanging in there with me. I know it's a little bit long, but we really need to end scene two and get started on scene three. So in our next video, we're going to dive into scene three, which is significantly shorter, and we are going to begin on the 14th of March, so the very evening before the Ides of March. We're getting closer to that climactic point of Caesar's demise. So please do make sure you continue to take notes as we get into scene three, because as you're going to note for your homework over the weekend due on Tuesday, May 5th, that you are going to utilize the notes you've been taking throughout scene two to answer the worksheet that's going to cover this scene. And I'll upload that on Google Classroom. Thanks for tuning in and see you on Monday.